let's let's start and go. I love this. This is one giant speed run, Alexi. It's great. Yes. <laughs> one yes. great intellectual speed run. Uh, let me see if I can get everything up here. Ricardo, please show up your face. Okay. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, let's see. We got all of this going here. Portion of the screen. Where is I want an application? Where is the silly thing? Uh, there it is. All right. There we go. Sharing the screen. Um, all right. So uh, very, very, very quickly. So what I'm interested in a lot these days is the dimensions of intelligence and understanding how do we compare and contrast systems that we believe are intelligence, like biological systems, and how do we measure the effective intelligence of artificial systems? And we've talked a lot about that. Lots of people have their own cognitive architecture. There's all kinds of cool stuff going on there. Um, but what I've found in, in some of my work in trying to quantify the dimensions of these things is some things I'm gonna cover very, very briefly here. So first of all, I just wanna, just wanna remind us that we're not the only generally intelligent things on the planet. Uh, if you want a fascinating example of a general intelligence, consider the mimic octopus. That's the picture of one there that looks like a sea snake. Uh, it is mimicking a sea snake visually and in dynamics in time which is the mortal enemy of its own predator, the parrotfish. So there's only one, and, th and there's no social communication among octopus. This is learned entirely by a single entity in its brief two year life. So this thing has figured out theory of mind about its predator and has also figured out that if it can imitate with its crazy body, it's, it's predator's predator, then it's gonna do better. I would love to have a robot to do that. that that's amazing. Uh, corvids are another wonderful example, right? Corvids actually, ravens and crows can actually develop associations and learn and pass that learning on to future generations without them having the same experience. And then they have the same associative effect in their behavior. This is stuff we don't understand. So when you start trying to measure it, you end up with, I'm just gonna look at kind of statics and dynamics here for a second. What's what is the what's the ontology of the you know we're all talking about knowledge graphs these days and and that's great. What's the ontology of, of the structure of information? What are the constraints that we put in place on our models? Simple things like just how big can they get? Uh, how many different kinds of things? What about the number of layers of abstractions? Can it can it form abstract concepts on its own? Can it form abstract concepts of the process of forming abstract concepts of the process of forming abstract concepts? These are usually fundamental limits built into people's architectures that you can describe and measure. What about composition? You know, does it support the notion of, of creating groups and sets and object creation out of groups of other objects? Can those be self-similar? Can they be ordered? Uh, these are questions you can ask directly about existing systems. Attributions, you know, we've had uh, one talk yesterday was uh, rebuilding a, a production system and they had their own types and and everything else. How many different kinds of types? Can you have concepts of types or, or relations described by concepts like David's thing was yesterday? What about implications, associations and rules, kinds? How, what kind of sequences can be learned? Is there, does it support its own algebra of sequence where it can actually do some causal reasoning across steps of processes or multiple processes? Can it remember individuals? Can it only, can it only remember classes of individuals? How many different kinds of maps does it support of information? Are they dense or sparse? What is the mean? What's the distance function in those in those things implied? What about remote ontologies? Can it develop a, a model of another mind and support theory of mind? That's my four minutes. Uh, I'm going to stop. <laughs> I told you I would, Ricardo. And but just just the things we talked about in the last couple of sessions the dynamics and metadynamics of these systems, not just the static modeling of the information, but then what kinds of parameters can the system modify itself? These are things that I find very fascinating questions and I think are worthy of trying to describe our systems in terms of. And, and, and Sam, it, it's interesting because uh, your, your point here, uh, in, in some sense, uh, is connected to, to one concern that I have myself that is, to try to create uh, proper uh, ways of representing these different kinds of, of uh, issues that we want to, to, to use in a cognitive architecture. Because 
uh, we cannot think that well, one, one just one kind of representation, for example, symbolic representation is going to do everything, or just numeric representation is going to do everything. But uh, it seems to me that uh, to each of these uh, uh, issues that you are pointing here, uh, there should be a way for representing them. And I, I'm not sure if uh, we, we will have uh, a one-to-one -one mapping. I mean, uh, each of these topics need a specific kind of representation, but right. there should be a kind of a core uh, uh, list of, of uh, representation uh, means for, for trying to, to uh, attend most of these uh, topics that you, you have presented in your, in your slide. So uh, I believe that this is an important question because if we don't set that clearly, uh, we will be always be accused of, okay, we are, uh, you, you are just uh, looking as if you are processing these things, but in fact, you are not. So, uh, uh, but if we have a specific structure, a, a, a knowledge structure that encodes these things, then we can say, no, this is uh, encoded in this uh, particular kind of, of representation structure and, 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 and the system is going in, in, in some way to, to create a, a, a mental model, uh, uh, making a, a dynamical change of these structures along time, and then our cognitive architecture will be uh, fully understanding those things. I, I, I like to, to use this uh, word uh, to understand because what I think that a current uh, intelligent systems or, or current cognitive architectures uh, are missing, uh, are lacking, are exactly this uh, ability to understand the world and to represent this world in, in, in a way that, okay, uh, I am convinced that it is really understanding what I'm saying and not just taking uh, uh, the idea that is really understanding that. I don't, don't know if you agree with me with, yeah, about that. No, I, I definitely agree. And one of the big challenges in, uh, and I, I mentioned that earlier to one of the earlier talks, uh, that you know this is such a vast space and it's such a wonderful space and it's so hard to grasp to get your head around it and what what i find this is useful for is i may not be able to explicitly tell you how intelligent something is versus something else but i could tell you that a system i can be pretty confident that a system that only supports explicit modeling of two levels of abstraction is going to be less intelligent than one that does three and so there's a relative scale that you can that you can establish here, and and you know you can do some of that. I think I, I think we can do that reasonably and agree. And it doesn't have to be all the same architecture, but the thing you mentioned about um, the different ways of representing, I believe actually that one of the biggest challenges it was asked for yesterday. I think it was David or somebody said, you know, hey, wouldn't it be great if we all got our architecture together and figured out how to use them together? We've done this a few times. You know, back ten years ago, the same question was asked. And before that, and before that, the problem is, is mushing all this into some consistent thing that actually works together is incredibly hard from an engineering perspective. Yep. And the thing I find interesting about these representations or, or these measures is that I can ask any representation, how do you fare on this dimension of intelligence? I, I used to think of them as almost like degrees of intelligence, like degrees of freedom in robotics, right? How many degrees of freedom does your cognitive system have? Right. What can it do? And there are certain things outside of that envelope that it just fundamentally can't do because it's too limited. And, and it's interesting because there are some things that are so uh, natural for us humans that we really don't uh, uh, understand how difficult it is. For example, uh, to count. Uh, it, it, do you think it's easy for uh, an agent to, to look around and start counting and seeing, oh, I can see three stones and then so one, two, three. This is something that we do very natural in ourselves, but uh, to make an agent doing that and, and, and really counting and not uh, making as if they are counting things, 
uh, I believe that uh, our agents will have to discover mathematics and, and a lot of things, uh, sequential sequential thinking and, 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 and the idea that order, that one thing comes first and then comes the, the other one, and then we have some kind of transitivity between these things. So all those things are, are, are things that are so natural to us, but we need to have a proper encoding of those things in, in, in a proper uh, kind of representation that we could convince ourselves that our agents are really doing that and not just passing in a, an image that they are doing uh, these in, in, in deep. Okay. Yeah, numerosity, the discovery, you know, is numerosity innate or learned is a fascinating AI topic, right? I mean, even just the notion of number, let alone number systems. I'm currently writing a paper with a friend on on the patterns of the patterns of prime factors of the gaps between prime numbers, right? This is like five five different levels of abstraction away from just counting things, yeah. and yet yeah. humans can do that. And if our systems are going to be able to do that, it has to have that ability to mix. You know, can it can it build a new concept about a self similar structure of events and activities observed over multiple periods of time across different species of agents that's one structure we can think that way can our systems that's the question yeah and and, and one thing that i believe that one of the the presenters the, the former presenters they they, they they told about this issue of a metaphor because uh, the ability of, of, of humans in, in uh, creating metaphors and, and applying these metaphors to, to different things it is really a, a, a quite difficult uh, thing. For example, uh, imagine that you are a robot and you are looking at uh, a person moving around in, in an environment, okay? Mm -hmm. um, well, each, uh, each other agent moving, uh, they will have uh, its own uh, movement. But how we can understand that, oh, those are going to the right and those are going to the left. So there are two different uh, ways of, of moving, going to the right of the obstacle or to the left of, of the obstacle. This is so natural to us, but at the same time, uh, how to do a robot to, 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 to really understand this metaphor of, of going right or going left and, and, and be able to understand that uh, if another agent took that direction, it's the same direction in, in a higher conceptual level of, of, of understanding. So. Uh, I, I believe this is, this is one of the biggest challenges that we have today for, for, for our cognitive architectures. So, so there was a great workshop last year. It was, actually, uh, it was actually this time last year, but it was actually the Spring Symposium of AAAI on analogy making systems. And I recommend people go and check that out. I actually think that it's way easier to do than people realize. We, we elevate metaphor and analogy because we look at the great metaphors. You know, when somebody says, oh, here's this have a pivony, and they say there's this wonderful mapping and it gives them extreme power. Uh, Douglas Hofstadter uh, made a really good point, I think, that analogy happens all the time. And I even like to think of the idea like how many cognitions per second your system has. So how many analogies per second is it making? Is it capable of? I mean, create analogies like crazy and throw them away, right? instead of saying, I'm going to have this really crazy, hairy system like GPT-3 or 4 or 5 or 9, that's going to sit there and cogitate over the entire mass of the internet and produce the, the magic abstraction or the magic analogy. What about generating them like crazy and throwing them away if they're not useful? I, I think there's lots of lots of interesting fruit there to go pick. Yeah. And, 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 and I believe, this is, this is my personal view at least, that one possible theory that we could incorporate in, in, in artificial general intelligence and, and in BICA in, in, in general is uh, Persian semiotics. Because uh, PERS has struggled a lot in trying to create a, 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 a system of different kinds of representations. And uh, we have this idea of having icons, uh, indexes, and, and symbols. And uh, those things uh, just uh, 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 calling uh, the other one. So I, I can see a symbol, and then I can transform this symbol into an index, and then transform this index into an icon. And when I have an icon, 
I can have a, a kind of a, a something that is similar in, in some sense to other things, and, and, and then I can say, oh, now I understand. This is, uh, this is an apple, this is an orange, this is a, a different kind of, of object because I, I can create a, a, a representation for, for this kind of, of things. And uh, Peirce has uh, given us a, a lot of different kinds of, 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 of signs to, to, to think about and uh, I believe this is one of the possible pathways uh, for newer kinds of, of intelligent systems and newer kinds of uh, uh, systems that are able to, to, to make this conversion between language and, and images and, and, and have uh, what uh, Barsalu calls a, a mental simulation. And, and a mental simulation might be just like us remembering a, a movement in time and, and, and then in, in some sense this is connected with uh, what I believe it was uh, Lila who was talking uh, calling uh, mental processes so, so uh, I, I believe that uh, I really like this this uh, idea of uh, making a, a systematicity of, of, of uh, mental models and, and trying to create categories of, of, of mental modelings and, and then maybe creating these kinds of representations that are, are, are uh, referring to them in, in some way. Yeah. So I, I would agree with you about, about Peirce. I'm, I'm a great fan of, of Peirce's semiotics and especially his notion of abduction. I think that's a, that's a very, very ignored aspect of cognition. Uh, I have maps of how does abduction and, abstra and abstraction and induction and deduction all connect together? You know, and how does, you know, when you think about the mental models, and, and I'm glad you mentioned uh, Lila's work and, and Jan's, Jan's team's work, because it's all got lots and lots of that stuff about mental models. I think that's a very, very excellent way of going about it. And the, the key, though, is the dynamics now. So not only can you model something in the literature, I like I liked Jan's response about that, you know, real human capability, but now how would you build a system to take that up another level? How does it generate its own process like that from, via experience? How does it generate its own metaphors? How does it decide which ones are good or bad? You know, how does it test them over time? Uh, I, I think all of that is really fruitful space. And, and, and I believe that it, it would be a, a very rich uh, thing when we connect these things with the cognitive architectures, because I believe that one of the most interesting things of, of cognitive architecture, that at least those uh, general kinds of uh, uh, cognitive architectures like Solar or, or Clarion or, or LIDAR or, or ACTR and, and, and all those things, because they are putting together a lot of theories that uh, are quite known in some sense. Okay, rule-based systems are, are, are known for, for a while. Uh, uh, neural networks, uh, well, the multilayer perceptron is here from more than, than, than 30 years. So uh, uh, the point is that in a cognitive architecture, you, you put these things to, to, to connect to each other, and then you create this architecture where now you're doing more than just rule-based system or just neural network systems or maybe neural symbolic systems. And you are putting those things to work together and, and, and then you coordinate a transformation of uh, different kinds of uh, uh, mental models into different kinds of mental models and each of them in, in its own kind of representation. And then with this uh, uh, more enhanced uh, cognitive architectures, uh, uh, we can have something more connected to the real uh, uh, architecture or, or of the mind. At least that is my, my, my view of, of the subject. I, I think, you know, coming up with these models and then the meta models, because you, we see a lot of that. Everybody's gone off and built their own cognitive architecture. And some of them have been decades worth of hundreds of people's work, right? They're huge efforts. They've got, they've done all kinds of cool work. But, but they all run out of gas at some point. And I think that's part of the recognition of just how hard the problem is we're trying to solve, right? Lots and lots of thousands of brilliant people have broken their picks on this one. <laughs> so, you know, but, but I like the idea, for instance, of meta models. So like, where's, where's the mental model for mental models? Yeah. 
right? I think that's a very powerful idea is go up another level of abstraction and saying, can your system reason about the mental models that it's creating? And can it reason about me reasoning about the mental models that I'm creating? I, I think that you got to have that. In, in some sense, I, I believe that this is what uh, Jan Thur is, is, is proposing with his uh, three-layer uh, 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 architecture, the idea of having a use of knowledge and then the adaptation of knowledge. And then uh, in, in the top, this is a kind of a meta model that is doing everything. It, it's some, some sort of metacognition that is, is, is happening in, 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 in the top part of, 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 of his architecture. I, I think it's... Uh, quite nice, and 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 th this this should be uh, maybe better understood for, for from everyone, so, such that people can use these things uh, uh, really. I, I think there's a there's one interesting perspective on that too. That these mental models in the control level, I like I like the top view we were talking about. I think Lila was talking about it. The, the 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 level at the top that was controlling, you know, learning and forgetfulness, for instance, is one of my favorite topics. Is is exploiting forgetfulness explicitly one, one of the uh david delerto wrote a great book a number of years ago called tides of mind and what he was looking at was describing human cognitive function in terms of circadian rhythms and and various other things and this notion of what are the dynamics that that move our mind around in different spaces in different creative or analogical spaces or whatever and then how do we engineer that and how do we tune that? And I think that all falls into to Jan's area. Well, I, I am controlling the time here. I, I believe that we have already spent our 20 minutes. So maybe we can open uh, to, to, to other people in, 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 in the attendance to, to, to make some contribution here too. You are right, Ricardo. Uh, you can continue during the break if you like. Uh, but for now, I guess we need to give the floor to our colleagues from Mexico. And I will start with a question to them. Are you really serious about running Biker 2022 in Mexico? Because we are counting on you. And I would like to hear a positive answer, of course. But uh, now I shall invite Felix and uh, Carlos, not sure who is coming first, uh, to share the screen, introduce yourself, and give the next talk. <clears throat> yes, um, actually, I, I will uh, present uh, the, you. the next one. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, you, you are the first on the, on the list of authors. But, but my <clears throat> question still remains uh, to I guess to your supervisors or whoever is in charge there. Oh yes, uh, uh, Dr. Felix. Um, give me. Um... Okay, please go ahead. Share your screen. Yes. <clears throat> uh, 